Good evening. Uh, welcome to those of you here in the audience, uh, and welcome to everybody uh, joining online. I'm Debbie Prentice, the Vice Chancellor. This is the second in an ongoing series of dialogues. The purpose of these dialogues, uh, which I first announced last October, is to provide a public forum for the open exchange of ideas and views, even when they are ideas we dislike or views we disagree with. Universities are places of learning. And arguably, we can learn more from listening to views that challenge our thinking than we can from listening to views that confirm it. Learning ultimately comes not from shutting out what we oppose, but from understanding a topic's many sides and reaching our own conclusions. And that requires an environment in which all topics can be discussed and all points of view expressed. Freedom of speech is a fundamental element of a functioning democracy, as we will discuss, I think, uh, and an enabling condition for university education. Free speech environments are not easy to create uh, and not always easy to inhabit, but they are sp the spaces in which learning can flourish. So that's what these dialogues are all about. They are experiments in learning to disagree well. Moderating tonight's discussion is the master of Selwyn, Roger Mosey, a former BBC journalist. Roger will begin by asking each of our three speakers some questions before instigating a conversation between them. I will then be encouraging our audience to put their own questions to our speakers. Uh, so please do start thinking about what you'd like to ask as we go along. Uh, this won't be a debate. Uh, we are not at the Cambridge Union. Uh, we are not here to choose winners and losers. Um, instead, we want to set off an open and honest exchange of opinions between the speakers themselves and between the speakers and the audience. We held the first of our dialogues uh, in the same auditorium back in November. It was about assisted dying. It was informative, powerful, and moving, actually. Uh, most meaningfully, it allowed speakers coming from diametrically opposed sides of the issue to acknowledge each other's views and, as they recognize themselves, actually, to adjust their own. I hope tonight's session will prove as interesting and as illuminating to us all. And so to the topic of our dialogue, is democracy dying? In the year when some two billion people, half the world's adult population, will be voting in national elections, we'll be asking whether we should be celebrating a milestone in our democratic history or whether we are at a crossroads where the fate of democracy hangs in the balance. To say more about this and to introduce our speakers, let me now hand things over to Roger Mosey. Vice Chancellor, thank you very much indeed. Um, so our panellists tonight, we have David Goodhart, who's head of the demography unit at the think tank Policy Exchange. He's the founding editor of Prospect magazine and author of the bestseller, The Road to Somewhere, The Populist Revolt and the Future of Politics. Uh, next to him, Nabila Ramdani, who's an award-winning journalist, broadcaster and academic, and her recent book is Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. And then alongside me, um, Helen Thompson, who's Professor of Political Economy here at Cambridge in the Department for Politics and International Studies. And not to be outdone, she has a book too, which is called Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. So as the Vice Chancellor said, um, I'm going to ask questions for five or six minutes of each of our panelists, um, then we'll have a discussion, and then we'll bring in questions from the audience. So, um, David, I'm going to ask you a straight question. Yep. Is democracy dying? Uh, no, obviously not. Um, this is catastrophism um, from those who lose elections, or in the case of the UK, referendums. Um, I think the dying thesis mainly comes from the main advocates of the dying thesis are on the liberal left, uh, and I think it does arise from confusion and anger about Brexit, Trump, perhaps also the loss of elite control over the public conversation that we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think most of those things are a, leg a legitimate challenge to what one might call undemocratic liberalism. I mean, in my the language of anywheres and somewheres, the anywheres, the, the liberal graduate class, you know, all of us, um, have ruled since the early 90s, I would say, primarily in their own interests. When you look at economics, the way that kind of post-industrial parts of countries have been allowed to rot, 
uh, the way that um, national sovereignty, which is not something that anywhere is the, the liberal graduate class particularly um, cling on to, they're, they're, they don't tend to be strongly nationalistic, they've been happy to distribute sovereignty to, to other bodies, they've been happy to coexist with um, uh, mass immigration without democratic consent. Education policy has mainly been about expanding higher education, uh, you know, technical and, um, um, and um, manual apprenticeship type education has been, uh, continued to be neglected, family policy, I mean, you can go through the whole, um, the, the whole gamut. Um, and because both parties signed up to this sort of broad world view and the policies that flow from it, uh, a lot of voters felt they, they didn't have a choice. Um, so they, they pushed back, given a chance in the UK with Brexit, um, voting for Trump in America. I mean, I think one should add to that, um, there have been many big failures of the political class in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, Iraq, the financial crisis, various EU crises, weak growth in recent times. And, you know, so is, has this pushback worked? Well, you know, um, anywheres are always going to remain with their hands on the driving wheel. Um, but you could say something like levelling up. Um, you know, a, a Conservative Party that has not historically shown any great interest in, in the kind of former industrial areas produced a really pretty impressive, uh, Michael Gove and Andy Haldane produced a pretty impressive white paper on levelling up. Not very much may have happened in that respect, but that would not have happened without the Brexit vote. Similarly, I heard John Crudders, uh, the Labour MP, saying the other day that both the sort of previous, both the kind of Blair Brown and the Starmer Labour periods saw as their sort of core voter base the, uh, the, the university graduate, the sort of comfortable one, perhaps in the Blair case, the sort of disaffected one in the, in the Corbyn case, and actually the Starmer Labour Party is actually genuinely trying to appeal to the kind of remnants of the old red wall working class. So, that, so, so yeah. just to be clear about it, um, you think democracy is working if you end up with Brexit, Trump, the Reform Party, Le Pen? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, I would say there is another critique, uh, which is from the right, which I think has more plausibility in some ways, um, that more and more power is flowing away from the traditional democratic institutions. This is the theory of the, the two constitutions theory of the American journalist Christopher Caldwell, who says that the first constitution is basic sort of democracy, voting in elections, the rule of law, and so on. Uh, but then the second constitution is all the kind of surrounding civil service, the media, the legal system, and so on and so forth. Um, the left tends to dominate the second constitution, the right often dominates the first constitution, and the second constitution in a sense sort of stymies the result of the first constitution. You know, you see it in ECHR decisions, you know, to prevent governments, you know, stopping boats coming across the channel, or most recently deciding that the Swiss uh, government has to um, implement an even more radical net zero policy because some judges in Strasbourg decided it. So I, I think there, there is, um, I mean, I don't think that, that, you know, that theory is also too pessimistic in a way because you do then get pushback against the, the second constitution. But you, you did, you wrote, I think 20 years ago, um, asking the question, is Britain uh, too diverse? And it did have a question mark. And a few months ago, I think you took away the question mark and said it was. Isn't the problem that um, I've seen you on Twitter recently talking about having a hard-headed UK citizen first approach to immigration? And it's all very well having parties winning elections by the system that occurs, but what if they then trample all over minorities? Well, where have they? Um, I mean, I haven't, you know, populist parties have been in power uh, either as part of coalitions or as the kind of main party in coalitions in seven or eight European governments now. I mean, where is the evidence that they are trampling on minority rights? I mean, the, you know, the, the critique is that the, 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 the large minority, if not majority, of somewheres of kind of non-liberal graduate citizens have not had their interest reflected. Um, and yeah, and one of those interests is to put the interests of national citizens before non-citizens. I mean, that, 
the, the idea that that is a sort of radical, uh, illiberal idea uh, just sort of shows how much we're dominated by the thinking of the second constitution. Would you be confident, it may be that in, in Britain and most Western democracies that's true, would you be confident that France under the pen or America under Trump would remain democracies as we understand them or as we have understood traditionally liberal democracies? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that there is a problem. I mean, I, I mean, one might call it, in contemporary Europe, one might call it Orbanism. I mean, the idea that you know, a government is trying to bend the rules, whether it's in the legal system or media ownership, so that particular parties stay in power forever. Um, I would say there's a, but I, I mean, basically all governments try to do that, more or less. Um, uh, you know, New Labour was very adept at, you know, putting its supporters in all of the, the institutions of the, of the second constitution very effectively. Um, but thankfully, you know, we just had an election in Poland where, um, you know, a government has, has been trying to manipulate the legal system and, and other things, and it, it's just been thrown out of office. You know, Orban's popularity is, you know, just when parties are in power for a very long time, they do, you know, barnacles attached to the boat in, and petty corruption becomes bigger corruption. And, and doing um, things like storming the capital, the regular kind of thing people do. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the catastrophists have to kind of come up with more evidence of the parties that are called populist. And pretty well all parties are also populist. You know, Tony Blair used to talk about New Labour is the political wing of the British people. I mean, you don't get much more populist than that. You know, talking about the, the many, not the few. I mean, uh, you know, people say this is the language of kind of Le Pen and Farage. It's also the language of mainstream politicians. It's just on a spectrum. Nabil Ramdani, is democracy dying? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me here tonight. It's always a pleasure to come back to uh, Cambridge. But uh, I think it's always useful in very complicated uh, discussions like the one we're having tonight to summarize our views as much as we can. And to this end, the first thing I'd like to say is no, I don't think that liberal democracy is dying. But I would say that instead, it's, getting, it's becoming more complicated. I think the concept of liberal democracy is struggling. That is to say that the demands on the concepts are absolutely enormous, and rightly so and uh, that the kind of systems we have in place to deliver liberal democracy are increasingly uh, failing. So, yes, 2024 is a great year for elections. We have masses of them coming up, not least of all in the United States and indeed across Europe. In principle, it should be a very good thing. More elections technically add up to more democracy, but as we know, uh, what works in principle doesn't always work in practice. And this is the case not just for the global north, but as well uh, for the global south. And I think that liberal democracy is under challenge on a global scale. Having said that, I think that any kind of democracy should, by definition, always be in some kind of, of, of peril, because dissent is a huge part of the concept. And if everybody just agreed uh, with each other about everything, uh, including about the way in, uh, state institutions are organized, then we wouldn't have much of a liberal democracy. I would uh, introduce a caveat, though, uh, that's when state institutions are deliberately uh, undermined, along with democratic uh, systems. And that's where we move towards anarchy. And as you quite rightly pointed, Roger, these are certainly signs with who, of people who want that globally, as we saw with the Capitol building um, uh, intrusion in Washington in, in January 2021, when you literally had so-called Democrats using violent occupation of the Capitol to try to keep Donald Trump in power. Now, less spectacularly, we also have an example of that in France, where I'm from, where President Emmanuel Macron's decisions to continually override the French parliament and indeed rule by decree, uh, completely disregarding a parliamentary system so as to impose legislation, is also pretty perilous. And this is one of the reasons why there has been so many riots uh, on his watch. 
And I think Macron's behavior is of great concern, but what worries me the most is when um, a, a far-right president comes to power and steps in his place in 2027, acting in the exact same way and imposing far more um, uh, frightening uh, policies. And as you say, you're, you're, you're French and you've written about France. Um, do you have a particular worry about France because of Le Pen and the electoral system, which could make that transfer to absolute power pretty easy? Well, absolutely, because um, my huge concern is uh, the presidential system in France at the moment, which, you know, France likes to think of itself as the birthplace of human rights and, crucially, the Enlightenment and all those concepts such as um, individual civil rights, the rule of law and the separations uh, of powers. And all these concepts add up to liberal democracy. Um, but um, one thing I can tell you about modern France is the presidential system that was uh, born out of the Algerian War of Independence in 1958 is actually uh, fits the very definition of an elective dictatorship because it allows one single determined individual to gain ultimate power. All they have to do is to win two rounds of presidential elections, and as Macron has proved, that can be relatively <laughs> easy to achieve. Um, if I told you that Emmanuel Macron had never won an election before standing for president and in indeed winning the presidency in 2017, you might be surprised. But um, more than that, he had no established political party b behind him before that. He just had an electoral movement called En Marche, which was, happens to be based on his initials, EM. Uh, now, if you look at the powers of the presidents in France, it's actually quite staggering that, uh, again, one individual can uh, rule uh, by decree, override parliament. Um, uh, he can um, uh, govern about every aspect of national life, act like a quasi-monarch. Um, other presidential powers include the fact that he can choose his prime ministers, he can appoint anyone he likes to his cabinet, whether friends or indeed corporate cronies. Not even the prime minister has to be an elected politician. But, uh, the president is also the commander in chief of the armed forces and he has his finger on the nuclear button. So that's a very um, concerning state of affairs. Look more broadly, though, because you, you've written about the racism and misogyny in, in, in France. But there is equally a view that um, if Le Pen or other politicians come to power, um, that it's actually about the majority in that country choosing the democracy that it wants. And it may be that people will have different views on whether you can or can't have religious symbols or religious dress and so on. But in the end, the majority community has its rights too, surely. But I think all good political systems are indeed about checks and balances and compromise. That's the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship. What's the compromise between whether you do or don't allow the hijab? Well, the difference is you, you submit it to a vote in Parliament and Parliament should be sovereign. But as it stands in France, Parliament isn't. And that's the difference. And that means that not only uh, somebody like Marine Le Pen, whose party, let's not forget has roots in fascism. The National Front was literally founded by members of the Waffen-SS and mm -hmm. indeed the French milice uh, that collaborated with Nazi Germany. That legacy hasn't gone away. That means that if somebody like her gets ultimate power, she can not only choose who is part of her government, she can legislate just like Macron does. Do you feel better about the British system than the French system? Well, absolutely, because it would be inconceivable to have 89 members of parliament of the far right, as is currently the case in the French parliament, sitting in the British parliament. And I often hear comparisons between Nigel Farage and Marine Le Pen. I can assure you that there's no comparison possible, or indeed Marine Le Pen's fellow travelers like Eric Zemmour, for example, of the Reconquest Party. Eric Zemmour is somebody who has been criminalized four or five times for inciting racial hatred and indeed religious hatred, it would be inconceivable for somebody with that background to stand for election, let alone for the ultimate job of the president uh, of France. 
But Eric Zemmour absolutely despises Marine Le Pen. I mean, they hate each other. Well, to the extent um, that his niece, her niece, is uh, a member of his party. She's the poster girl for, for his party. Let me bring in Helen Thompson. So we said this is the year of uh, elections right across the world and more than two billion people voting. So um, is democracy objectively at risk so far as you can assess it as an academic? <laughs> No, I think is the answer, but with some significant like caveats. I think you have to break the question down into the different ways in which democracy could be at threat and then say, is this going on in different places? And if you take one case of this, which would be democracy coming under threat because of intense inequality of wealth and income so that democracy becoming more oligarchic. So instead of having some semblance of the government of the many, it looks like the government of the few. I think that you can say that the election that's taking place in the United States has taken place against such a background for some time. And if you look at the criticisms that were being made about American um, democracy in the 20 years or so, perhaps the 15 years or so before 2016, they tended to be around this issue of it being oligarchic. That's the basis on which Bernie Sanders ran in 2016. I think Jimmy Carter had said that essentially now the United States is an oligarchy. And there's no doubt that in a way, Trump, although he was a member of that oligarchy in a number of respects, kind of tried to act as a whistleblower on it at the same time. If you said, is democracy a threat because of the values that people who participate in the democracies at leadership level or aspiring to leadership level because they don't have democ democratic values, then I think you start getting into territory where you say yes again in some ways. And I would say that that is certainly true in regard to some of what goes on in France. And I think that the crucial question there is, is are there attacks being made on people's being citizens of that country for nativist reasons? So are people trying to make arguments that basically conflate ethnicity and citizenship? Mm -hmm. And when I think that they start doing that, then I think you can say that they are not democratic because democracy and equal, citizen sorry, equal citizenship is a fundamental part of democracy. The overriding, though, question, I think, for any democracy is, and David sort of hinted at this in a way, is, is there loser's consent? So when mm. the side... <laughs> who loses the election, loses, do they accept the outcome? And I think that you can argue that here, most of the time, there's not that much to worry about. I don't think that's true in Britain, for instance. You can argue about the referendum, but in the end, the general election settled the question. I think in France, you can say that it's not threadbare, but in some difficulty, and you might say that the Gilets jaunes movement after Macron's election last time was a reflection of losers' consent problems. The big case is the United States, because there you get it from both sides. I think it's undoubtedly true that Trump did not accept losing the last election, that some of his supporters did not accept losing the last election. But I also think it's undoubtedly true that Hillary Clinton didn't really accept losing the 2016 election, <laughs> that a significant section of her supporters didn't, and then that election was pursued uh, by cases involving intelligence agencies. So I think that... A, the United States is the one, it seems to me, that across the board has got the biggest problem because loser's consent is weak. And it's not at all difficult to imagine that it will, we will see how weak it is, whichever side wins the election in November. Mm. D David Cheerily said um, it's a bunch of liberals here tonight. Um, and um, I suppose we test that. Is it a problem that people do at times become alarmist, I think the word David used, so that you say, well, um, you know, Trump is terrible and so is Johnson and Brexit was terrible and this shows the great tide. And actually, um, the analysis is not... I mean, you just did a, a more sophisticated piece of analysis about loser's consent, but is it because liberals sort of jump on the table and scream when they see someone who has a view that doesn't concord with theirs? But to some extent... There is some truth in that, but only to the extent that it's also true on the other side as well. And that's why I think that it's seeing it through the lens of loser's consent and looking where it's absent and seeing that it can be absent both from the 
liberals on occasion and particularly um, from the right. I mean, Brazil is another place where I would say that loser's consent has been shown um, to be weak in, in relation to the um, last um, election. So I think that what is really important, if you look at this as a historical question, for whether loser's consent stands, is uh, does nationhood work? Now, you might say that's in some tension with what I've just said, because I do think it's problematic when ethnicity and nationhood are fused together, and then people who don't have an ethnicity of natives are then treated to be as either non-citizens or as inferior citizens when they are citizens. But if you look historically, the thing that has made loser's consent hold is some sense of national identity. And I don't mean by anything to do with ethnicity in relation to that. I just mean some sense that you are citizens together in a nation. And when that breaks down, and it has broken down, I think, in the United States, I don't think it's broken down in European countries in quite the same um, way. France might be a more complicated um, mm -hmm. question. Then, on both sides, you end up with a problem because people think that they do not accept losing to the people that they end up losing elections to. And I think that some liberals, not all liberals obviously, uh, do f have a difficulty with being on the losing side, but they're not the only ones who have a difficulty being on the losing side. Um, David, you have written about um, populism, how we define it, and say that um, populists feel themselves to be victims of one strand, which is a domineering illiberal liberalism. And you also say that if you remove the democratic from it, you end up with liberal technocratic priorities of international openness, income maximization, individualism, diversity, and so on. So, um, I mean, just out of interest, is, is that what you think Nabila represents, and uh, why do you think that that is a problem? Um, well, no, although um, Nabila's Wikipedia picture does have her standing in front of the... Uh, the World Economic Forum <laughs> Davos sign. Um, so I guess Nabila is Davos woman. Um, Hardly. But, uh, <laughs> um, no, but um, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't want to sound complacent about democracy. And I do think, um, I mean, this whole question of ethnicity and citizenship, um, I mean, it is central to contemporary politics. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a kind of bolt on though to, to, the kind of historic conversation about democracy. I mean, are we saying that Britain in 1964 was not a democracy because it didn't have race discrimination laws, it didn't have equal pay legislation? No, of course not. I mean, norms shift and norms, um, so we now regard that as part of the sort of essential basis of a democratic society that, um, that somebody who's a citizen from a minority ethnicity should have full citizenship rights. It's just, and a tiny number of people in the UK don't agree with that. It's like about 3% of people say uh, you have to be white to be truly British. Um, I suspect the number is also very small in France. Um, you know, that is assuming that you know, all, all the citizens we're talking about ha you know, have the country's interests at heart. I mean, obviously there are kind of extremists um, among the minority populations, as indeed there are among the majority population. But, um, I mean, I think the, um, yeah, I mean, that, that is a, a, a kind of legitimate ad. I mean, you know, we argue about, you know, what, what is it that, um, you know, all of those things that precede democracy and make democracy possible, like the rule of law and minority rights and free speech and free media and so on. And, you know, I mean, this is one of the differences between Europe and the rest of the world. Europe has, has the historic luxury, if you like, of having all those liberal things um, developed over hundreds of years before electoral, electoral democracy came along. And that, in a way, is our great blessing, whereas that isn't the case in India. Um, you know, I mean, you know, one of the elections that is coming up very soon is in India, and there I think one might have legitimate worries about um, you know, how Muslims in India are going to fare after uh, what one assumes to be another Modi victory. Um, but I mean, uh, can, can I just very quickly, the, the, um, my kind of non-complacent hat um, is that, um, and Helen touched on this, is the kind of the polarization problem. Um, we have democracy now is going to probably be operating 
in this country and other European countries in a sort of zero economic growth context. So you may end up with a much more zero sum um, democracy. I mean, most, for most of the history of democracy, people's conditions of life and, and um, standards of living have been growing with, with occasional blips. Uh, that may no longer be the case. We have the, we have the social media algorithms you know, with the huge confirmation bias and the kind of ridiculing and caricaturing of views that you don't agree with. Um, again, that, that, that didn't used to be so much the case when more people watched the BBC when you were there, Roger. Um, uh, it was a kind of, you know, these sorts of unifying institutions um, have less power. And I do think the fact that cultural issues, you know, like national borders, uh, national sovereignty, immigration, the way in which cultural issues have become at least, if not more important than traditional socioeconomic issues, it's much harder to compromise uh, on cultural issues than it is on socioeconomic issues. You know, if you have a you have a socioeconomic argument about you know taxing rich people more, and you know do you, people on the left want to tax them ten percent more, people on the right want to tax them five percent less. You know, you compromise because of the leftist ratchet in many democratic egalitarian societies. You end up taxing them three percent more, um, whereas on cultural issues. You, it's much harder to split the difference. So, Nabila, as Davos woman, are you, mm -hmm. are you reassured? I mean, David's yes. really saying, it'll be all right, don't worry, <laughs> elect whoever you want, and it'll be fine. No, I, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to distance myself <laughs> <laughs> from the Davos crowd for the record. <laughs> I'm very much a woman of the people. Um, but also, my background being Algerian and French um, uh, has... Uh, forge my view of, of, of the country I grew up in, uh, not least of all because it um, made me realize how peculiar France is in the, compared to other countries in Europe. I think, Helen, you touched on that. And I, and I very I mean, it's not my words, it's uh, General Charles de Gaulle, the, you know, the wartime leader and the architect of the Fifth Republic, who refers to France as a perpetual illusion for the very simple reasons that France is a country made up of very beautiful myths and it doesn't deliver on those myths, unfortunately. It's very much a parallel universe where the culture is much admired to the extent that it's the most uh, visited uh, tourist destination in the world, but there are plenty of Francophiles who have no idea about the, the raging angst below the surface. And uh, let me uh, take a couple of examples. I mean, last year was a particularly uh, uh, agitated year in terms of turmoil in France, and that says something in a country that was literally built on revolution. Um, uh, millions of French citizens regularly take to the streets, the people, the demos, because they are angry about you know, how the founding principles of the French constitution um, uh, I literally, um, d d France doesn't live up to its uh, myths in, its, in essence because in principles the constitution of the uh, current Fifth Republic is meant to deliver liberty, equality and fraternity for all but in practice it only de delivers uh, those ideals for some, for those with the right education, with the right background, with the right gender and the right connections and this is the great contradiction at the heart of the French Republic, which stems from its very constitutions. And that's why you get angry people on the streets all the time. There were two massive riot seasons last year. One, to express uh, outrage at the shooting dead of a, uh, an ethnic minority by a policeman. And the other, to oppose pension reforms that Emmanuel Macron pushed through without parliamentary approval. And that was a prime example of how undemocratic the French political system is. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I think um, um, Helen has kind of put America on a watch list and you've got France on a watch list. In the UK, which obviously you know incredibly well as well, um, do you, would you worry if there was a, a reform party government at some time in five or seven years' time? Is there the same risk? No, I think uh, the British uh, system, uh, like other um, systems across Europe in, in general, are quite good at keeping extremes out of power. Uh, I think there are mechanisms, constitutional mechanisms, that uh, are uh, 
uh, geared towards keeping extremists out of ultimate power, meaning that you can always have a system where co you can work with coalitions like Germany uh, does, for example, or indeed have checks and balances uh, like in the UK. And when I do worry is when you do not have this kind of mechanism that keep uh, dangerous people uh, away, out of power. And I don't mean by that that populism per se is a threat in itself. I think that uh, it's not... I don't consider it a threat to democracy. I don't view it as a breakdown of democracy. I view it as an expression of democracy, whereby, uh, you know, um, in essence, you have uh, ordinary people feeling that their concerns are being disregarded by established elites. And um, again, France is a prime example of that, where you have uh, the richest people, some of the richest people in the world, uh, billionaire industrialists who earn more money than they'll ever need, and literally some of the poorest uh, people uh, around. And um, but I, I, let me just bring. I want to bring Helen in and David, and then I think probably we'll, we'll get questions from the audience. Um, Helen, there, there is, I think, something lurking beneath this a bit about electoral systems. Um, I just wonder, um, you know, w when I was growing up, it was generally thought proportional representation would be a good thing to allow the nice liberals in the middle to get into power and have a bit of sort of brokerage. I is it now the case that if you look across Europe and the wider world, proportional systems <clears throat> are sometimes having the reverse effect of enabling minorities of left or right extremes? I think if you go back to the early 2000s or even like the late 1990s in Austria, you can see considerable concern being expressed about the way in which electoral systems that allow many parties to be represented in Parliament was facilitating the rise of what was then tended to be called the populist right rather than the, the far um, right. And sometimes those parties would get into government. Austria is a good example. Uh, of um, that. I think if you then move to 2017, I'm picking that quite deliberately as the year of that year of the UK election, where both the two main parties in Britain did pretty well after periods in which the combined share of the vote had declined, you can say that whatever else you thought about Brexit, it had structured an election in which there was a clear choice between two parties, Corbyn's Labour Party, Theresa May's Conservative Party, and the two main parties ended up with a higher share of the vote than they'd had in a long time. Indeed, in fact, larger, I think, than at any time in which Britain, since Britain had joined the European um, community. I think that there's something more that's going on, and I don't think we should be complacent of just thinking, OK, if you just have an electoral system that um, doesn't do what the French does and perhaps does what the British does, that you will take care of the issue. Because if you look at the way in which the party systems are generally working in European countries, I think you can see different versions of a problem, and that is that the party <coughs> systems that formed in the middle of the 20th century and that carried on thereafter aren't really structuring effective conflict between the big groups in society around democratic elections, and that what you get is either a situation in France, where actually the party system could collapse in 2017, as it had as been, it did. Mm -hmm. by essentially one individual, as you said, running a personal movement, uh, and then presiding really over the disintegration of the Socialist Party as a as a as a consequence, or you get the situation in Italy, where you basically have um, now quite a long period of time in which the present Prime Minister is actually the first elected Prime Minister, mm -hmm. uh, and that generally the, the finance ministers have not been elected because the central banks have been putting sort of parameters around who can hold um, office and the old party system can't hold. Or you have Germany, which I think is an interesting case because Germany under Merkel, at least, was being held up as that, oh, look, Germany's fine. We don't have anything to worry about. If we could all just be like Germans, we'd be fine. Um, but actually, the, the Germany's found it harder and harder to form coalitions. So you've gone from two-party coalitions to three-party coalitions. And this one, Free Democrats, Social Democrats, and um, Greens, is highly dysfunctional. They can't agree about very much at all, and they've not been able to deal with a whole range of problems like as a, as a consequence. 
the Dutch had an election, I can't even remember when it was, was it sometime in the autumn, and they still haven't really got resolved a government as a consequence um, of it. So I think that the electoral systems, whatever that they are, are not working particularly effectively at allowing either a good opportunity for voters to express their differences, mm. or in some instances, actually to form governing coalitions after those elections take place. Quick one, David, yeah. then we're going to bring in I mean, I, I would kind of want to stick up, I mean, uh, against what uh, Nabila was saying, I'd want to stick up in some ways for the continental European uh, proportional representation systems. I mean, I think first past the post system, I mean, particularly the UK and the US, the systems have turned out to be very brittle. Um, so, you know, so the most dramatic examples of populism succeeding you know, have been in the UK and the US um, because it's very difficult to sort of break the, the duopoly of the traditional parties. So the only way in which, as it were, legitimate populist forces can be expressed is through taking over one of the parties, as has clearly happened with the Republican Party. Um, uh, and that brittleness in the UK, I mean, I think if, if UKIP had had, or, or similar party in the UK, had had, say, 70 seats in the UK Parliament, you know, back in the, in the 2010s, we would not have had Brexit. Um, and this is what's happened in continental Europe. Essentially, populism has been domesticated. You've had all, all of these parties, that m many of which had terrifying beginnings, um, and incidentally were very asymmetrical about this. We've, we completely forget about the fact that half the members of the Blair cabinet were Trotskyists when they were in their 20s, as indeed was Keir Starmer. Um, but there's no, you know, people don't sort of say, go, oh my God, you know, he was a Trotskyist. But we do go, oh my God, he was a fascist. Um, but, you know, look at what's happened in continental Europe. All of, you know, Maloney, you know, a party that was literally born out of the fascist party, you know, now regarded as completely mainstream in many ways. Um, and they, and they, you know, they changed. They have to, they come up against reality. The Danish People's Party, you know, has, has more, more or less doesn't exist any longer. I mean, that's partly because the Danish Social Democrats have had the good sense to adopt quite a lot of its most popular policies. So PR allows these parties to kind of sort of grow and, and, and become more, more realistic and, and, and lose the, the kind of frightening aspects of their kind of illiberal pasts. Um, uh, Vice Chancellor, I think you're going to... <clears throat> Bring in the audience? I am. <clears throat> so I hope you all have your questions prepared. We can, uh, do we have mics or do we need them? I guess not. Uh, we we, we don't have do them, have so let's just say we don't but, need uh, them. Oh, it's yeah. over there, actually. Okay. Some, and the, uh, ah, oh, here's the yeah. So um, speak into the top of the microphone when it reaches you, and if you signal. Signal if you'd like to ask a question. I have a terrible throw. <laughs> oh, that's very good. It's just like, do you play American football? <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so I've got a question to do with proportional representation, which we've just <clears> been discussing. And in the famous book about how democracies die, there's this idea of sort of constitutional guardrails, which the parties themselves put in place, similar to your idea about the second um, constitution. And with proportional representation, one of the issues we've seen in forming coalitions in all these different continental European governments is the fact that there is normally a populist right party or far right party or whatever you want to call them who is excluded from coalition governments. So in the Germany, it's the AFD. In the Netherlands, it's uh, Gert Wilder's party. And there's been issues, I don't think it's a proportional system, but in Portugal, I think it's called Chega in their most recent election. Good question. Yeah. So do you think that... Um, uh, parties, moderate parties, should continue to do that in order to protect democracy? Or is it even making democracy more likely to die because they're excluding such a significant part of the population and because they're not addressing these issues and they're having to form these unwieldy coalition governments? David? Well, I guess the best example of the attempt to exclude a populist party from the political mainstream was Sweden and the Sweden Democrats. And the Sweden Democrats um, are now kind of, you know, effectively running the government. Um, they're not actually in the government, but it is, it's kind of run with their consent. Um, 
and they are another example of where a you know, party with a very uh, unattractive origins um, has uh, grown and grown and moderated most of its views uh, um, and you know has, has uh, you know has, has proved to the exclusion the exclusion really just massively increased support for the Sweden Democrats I mean they became the most popular party in Sweden for a time um, and, it, and it proved completely counterproductive I mean I fear that Germany obviously Germany has a <coughs> more difficult historical background to deal with uh, so he's even more sensitive to the you know, historic origins of parties. But, I mean, the fact that the Turingian branch of the AFD may be banned do does not seem to me to be a good idea. I think, you know, you know allow these parties to, to show themselves in their true colours. Um, would you, if they would you agree are, with that? If they are sinister. Yeah, I mean, I think that the German case is quite complicated. I mean, I think that the, the AFD are at the harder end, uh, or the more worrying end, um, when it comes to the conflation of ethnicity and citizenship. I mean, what I do th think... There's a spectrum in the party, yeah, I think. In the, if you take the Italian case, you can read it, I think, like both ways. On the one hand, you could say, look, in the end, that every time that the parties that got labelled populist, so that was in 2018, um, five Star and La Lega won. You let them go into office, but you dilute it by saying, as I said earlier, that you can't have the prime minister's job and you can't have the finance minister's job. They must go to like technocrats. And then when things get a bit difficult, you say you can't even have those jobs. Actually, <coughs> Mario Draghi is coming out of wherever he was, uh, not immediately from the ECB, and he's going to take over as prime minister. And we're going to bring all these parties into a grand coalition in the Italian parliament. Um, to support that, and the one party that was excluded from all that was a, you know, the Brothers mm. of Italy, and then lo and behold, it's the one that ends up winning the next um, election. So that w would be a story in which said that actually you only strengthen mm. the furthest party to the right when you keep pushing a narrative that says they can't be in government because they're not responsible. What you end up with is the, some of the voters at least identifying who feel excluded from democratic politics, identifying almost with a party that then looks like it's being excluded from democratic um, politics. And then, as you can say, um, Maloney has not been quite the same kind of leader as many people thought. I mean, how much that's to do with her positioning on Ukraine may be like open to um, question, but I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea that we could generalize about the answer to this question. I do think that Germany's got a trickier problem on its hands than say Italy has in this respect. Nabila, briefly. Yes, I, I would say that you know there is nothing wrong with you know the fact that people across Europe and indeed around the world do share the same concerns nowadays because those issues tend to be a global ones such as uh, concerns over immigration, globalization, cost of living crisis, uh, you know housing crisis, the fact that capitalism uh, fails a, a great number uh, of people, for example. And there's nothing wrong with having uh, a populist uh, response to uh, those uh, very real uh, problems. But I think the problem comes when, uh, um, when those uh, with very sinister motives are, try are trying to appeal uh, to the masses so as to manufacture uh, popularity. And this situation can get very serious indeed and very dangerous, as we saw with the rise of fascism uh, in, across Europe before the Second World War. So I think that's when uh, the danger is. And um, I think uh, there's an, um, an argument to be made, as you made, David, that uh, uh, far-right parties or extremist parties in general tend to mature and grow up uh, once they get into government. I would tend to disagree with that. If you look at the, for example, the forthcoming parliamentary um, uh, EU uh, elections, uh, parliamentary elections, you know, uh, the far-right parties, for example, always do well in European elections, rather like the British right wing used to do well uh, when it was in the EU. The irony, of course, is that those parties um, are often massively opposed to Europe, and yet that's where they build their power base uh, in the European Parliament. And in the case of the French uh, 
National Rally Party of Marine Le Pen, uh, this is even more the case. I mean, the EU has been, the European Parliament has been for Marine Le Pen a lifesaver. She used to struggle to win a seat in Parliament, let alone hold on to it, and yet got very easily uh, elected in, in Strasbourg. And this tradition will continue in the forthcoming parliamentary elections. Uh, the French far right is uh, pro projected to make huge gains uh, uh, at the EU elections, and it will be a chance to let off steam and uh, express uh, uh, people's anger, to allow people to express anger without affecting domestic politics too much. Okay, um, I, I, but, I just uh, want to make sure we, we get quite a lot of questions in, <laughs> and, and, and if I could ask for short questions and then equally bopping around responses. Um, so, yeah. Vice Chancellor, where are we going next? All right. When it gets to you and you have a question, speak into it. Thank you. That was very slow. <laughs> uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion tonight. Um, I guess my question is um, kind of turning um, the question of tonight on its head. And I want to ask... Um, everyone's views on this as um, is democracy simply a, a theory, an ideal that's never really been put in place in practice? Um, is it something that has existed on paper and in the theories of people like Schumpeter and Dahl, etc.? Um, has it ever really existed in practice? Um, for instance, when we think about the case of the United States and um, the, the grand theories of the Founding Fathers, um, and we think about the US today and how the reality doesn't quite match up with the image, um, can we say that democracy was never really alive? I think that sounds like a perfect question for Helen. <laughs> <laughs> what I do think is that, um, I, I, do, I, do, I think it's wrong to say that democracy's never been alive. I think that it's perfectly possible to identify uh, a form of government that depends upon elections taking place and there being certain rules about those elections and that at the end of a period of power for a party or parties that have won that election, you have another election and you have a peaceful um, exchange of power. I don't think that that is an illusion. I, I, I think that actually describes something that's real in the world in which we live and it distinguishes it from other forms of government. We know that that's democracy and it's not monarchy. And I know that sounds like a very Schumpeterian answer if you've been reading like um, Schumpeter, and it was intended um, to be. If though you say, is it the case that democracy is what people think it is? Then I think the answer is no. And actually I think even in the course of my lifetime, I was born in like 1967, um, that the ways in which democracy was talked about when I was a child and an adolescent, a very early adult, um, are quite different than the way that they are now. There was much less, I think, expectation about democracy delivering mm. some sense of identity or set of um, values. It's afraid, I think, it's Fukuyama as much as anybody, if you want to put the blame on somebody, <laughs> in the 90s, who puts all this, not just end of history narrative on it that we know, but this idea that what democracy does is it makes us all feel equal, it makes us feel good about ourselves, it gives us equal themos, or satisfies our themos in equal ways. That's just nonsense. It's just like, historically, it just doesn't do that. And aside from anything else, it produces winners and losers every election um, time. It's not, we have an equal right as citizens to vote, but the equality doesn't go beyond that. And it certainly isn't a basis on which we can then understand who we are as individual human beings. So I think part of our problem, actually, post-90s, is that we expected far too much from democracy. But that doesn't mean that it's not real. It just means that we shouldn't give it something that it can't possibly deliver to us. And be the quick fire. Is there a country anywhere in the world at the moment you think looks like perfect democracy? It is France on paper. <laughs> <laughs> Constitutionally, it absolutely is the perfect system. Who would 
argue with liberty, equality, and fraternity for all. And as Helen quite rightly reminded us, um, those ideals were grounded in sacred texts, not least of all the whole tradition of enlightenment. You know, our revolution, 1789, was meant to deliver all those freedoms for, for everyone. And it certainly, France's tradition of enlightenment and indeed of the revolution, accelerated the drive toward liberal democracy that was... Um, already, um, you know, following other key historical events, uh, for example, the, the signing of the Magna Carta in this country in 1215. But I would say the danger is, is when you uh, present uh, it as a myth, you know, uh, it has to be something tangible that benefits to all. And I think the danger is when you have uh, far-right parties that promise to deliver a lot and achieve very little. And just to finish my point on um, responding to David's arguments about, I don't necessarily believe that people who um, uh, present themselves as you know, at the fringes mature when they get to government. And I would certainly argue that it wouldn't be the case of a party like the National Rally in France. There is no uh, guarantee whatsoever that Marine Le Pen will shed uh, the legacy of her party. And David, where do you think is wonderfully functioning at the moment? Well, Switzerland is usually held up as the model democracy, perhaps until the recent decision of the ECHR to impose a particularly even more rigorous form of net zero on it that it wanted. Um, and actually, Switzerland is an interesting... One, one of the things we haven't really discussed so far is sort of where should democracy reside, kind of local, national, international, um, and what should the balance between those things be? And, and Switzerland probably has a better balance between those kind of locations of democracy than, uh, than any other country. Debbie, I think we, we agreed we would go a little past seven o'clock, so we will, we will keep going if you're okay. happy to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> So my question is about social mobility, the idea of social mobility and to what extent that might be important for a democracy. So like, what are the chances of someone today from a deprived background, a young person going on to become, say, prime minister, are those, is that important um, for the health of a democracy? I mean, I think uh, typically a, one key method of social mobility was said to be education. Um, but I think that education is increasingly, or higher education is increasingly failing people and, and the sort of younger liberal graduates these days don't necessarily get what might have been promised to their older liberal graduates. And yeah, so my question is really sort of, yeah, social mobility, is, is this an issue for the future of democracy? Um, it's kind of tapping into the question of oligarchy, I it think. Is, it is also remarkable, isn't it, Helen, that at the moment, if you look at the First Minister of Scotland, First Minister of Wales, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, the Mayor of London and the Prime Minister, there is no white man among them. Yeah, I think that democracy is, in the long term, well served when you have the scenario that you've just described, like Roger, and that there is a sense that one social background, and I'm using social in the broadest sense of that um, word, is going to be no inhibition to anybody who wants to participate in politics, including actually having a professional career in politics, which is what is required, obviously, in Western democracies if you're going to um, get to the um, top. I don't think at any particular time, in any one instance, if you see what I mean, it matters that much what the social background of the, the Prime Minister or the, the President is. But if you have a situation in which it's very clearly a small cast of people who are just <coughs> producing leaders over and over again, then I think that's a problem, a big problem for democracy. And I would say, going back to the US and the oligarchy point, that if you wanted a really crucial indicator of what was wrong with American democracy in, sorry, in 2016, it would be that moment when it looked like both of the parties, this is before Trump succeeded with the Republicans, were going to put forward as their candidates Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, i.e. that the presidencies were going to go Clinton, 
Bush or Bush Clinton, Bush with a bomber in the middle, and then Clinton. But dynastic, overt dynastic politics and democracy is terrible for it. David. Yeah, I mean, I think we're actually doing better on social mobility than um, than we often give ourselves credit for. Um, Oxbridge, I mean, taking sort of private school um, background as a sort of key indicator. You know, if there are too many private school background people at, you know, at Oxbridge or in Parliament, you know, you think you're not doing very well. Well, you know, Oxbridge is now over 70% state school. I mean, it's probably, made, you know, overwhelmingly middle-class people still, but 70%, you know, it was 50% only a few decades ago. Um, Parliament is about 25% um, private school which is a lot, you know, like 60% like of the Tory party are non-private school, which again is, is a, a remarkable and generally unremarked upon change. Um, but I think the broader point that democracy has generally, for the last, you know, 100, 150 years, been associated with kind of progress and success and people moving up and on because, on the whole, democracy has been associated with economic growth and, and improved living conditions. And my kind of worry is that that, that that era may be coming to an end. Um, and, uh, and people have become, people outside Europe, looking at Europe, are becoming much more cynical about um, the idea of European democracy. And one of my daughters works quite a lot in Africa. And, and she says, you know, people in places like Ghana and Senegal are, are all kind of, you know, very much looking at China these days. Um, and, or, you know, and indeed, there is a kind of African model of, uh, of managed stroke illiberal democracy in Rwanda. Um, you know, Rwanda is actually doing pretty well economically, uh, as obviously China has been doing um, for many decades, um, uh, without having the normal kind of trappings of, uh, of, of liberalism and freedom that we associate with democracy. So, yeah, I mean, I think. In looking at the bigger kind of global picture, I think European liberal democracy um, is not looking so healthy from outside Europe. But, that, and that, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know, it, it looks as if there isn't so much social mobility because there isn't, the, the economy is not growing. And most social mobility comes when there's kind of more room at the top in the higher professional classes. And if those jobs are not being created to the same extent, then... Yes, I think the... Um the uh, issue of social mobility is often uh, linked to somebody's background and it shouldn't be. And that uh, uh, definitely uh, um, works against the very principle of, of democracy. And, and that is a, a problem. And in, uh, in France, for example, uh, the, the unofficial statistics are shocking because, believe it or not, it's actually forbidden to collect data about ethnic minorities in France based on race or religion. So if you can't monitor the extent of the problem, then it's uh, very difficult to, to fix it. And, uh, but uh, there are unofficial surveys carried out by sociologists, for example, and they um, reveal that 91% of black people are the victims uh, of uh, the victims of, of racism, for example. Um, police brutality is often in the news. You know, you often hear about young people from an ethnic minority background being shot by police, um, and it's. Uh, it's all about, dare I say, the, sh the social contract uh, to keep society together and hold and hold it together. And in in France, it, it's not working. And the, it's there is no doubt that it's this kind of e uh, extreme economic injustice and indeed the kind of deep seated racial and religious. Um, discrimination that manifests itself in the rise of populism, in the rise of the far right, to the extent that they have become mainstream, something that hasn't happened in the context of Britain. And this kind of um, uh, banalization of the far right is constantly rehearsed in the media in France, for example. And that's what I worry about. When you have somebody like Emmanuel Macron, for example, who presented himself in 2017 as a, a progressive liberal politician who pledged to reform France, but who, whose own policies ever since he became president, from law and order to immigration, have become far more reactionary to the extent that he rehearses himself 
uh, theories such as the Great Replacement Theory, by which uh, he means that the indigenous population is so slow to reproduce itself that it will one day be overtaken by um, large families from North African or North African background. So this is not just... Uh, you know, fantastical, but it's deeply racist. And Macron uh, rehearses this policy. He's the president of France, uh, these, these theories, in order to appeal to the kind of xenophobic voters that would go vote for Marine Le Pen and her Rassemblement National or indeed Eric Zemmour. So it's the banalization of those extreme ideas uh, that are very dangerous for any society and, and certainly put uh, people from uh, an ethnic minority background or from a perceived uh, foreign background in, in greater risk. Okay. I think we're going... I have, Debbie, I think I have, we're going I have an eye on somebody about here. Less than 10 minutes in total, so, so quick questions and answers. Please. Thank you very much. Um, so I am the elected Liberal Democrat leader of South Cambridge District Council. Um, so I don't for a minute believe that democracy is dead. But <laughs> do you... Do you sh thank goodness. Really but do you, do you share my concerns about what I perceive as emerging threats in the UK to the democratic process? So I cite the need now for voter ID, which will disenfranchise some thousands of people. Um, this government's obsession with local government reform that means there will be far fewer elected representatives working at local government. And what concerns me most is the normalisation of abuse and even violence to all of us who are in elected positions, which is making it increasingly difficult to encourage anyone to come and join us, in particular women and anyone with protected characteristics. OK, um, I think I'm just going to let Helen alone answer this one, then we can go on to other questions. I mean, there's a lot of different things there. I mean, I have to say, I don't actually regard that uh, the ID requirements as a great threat to democracy. I think you can argue them both sides, but I, I don't think it's intrinsically unreasonable to say that people need to prove that they actually are entitled to vote. Now, you can argue about how that, that's implemented and whether it's done in, like, discriminatory um, ways, but I think that people believing that they have some trust that the rules are being upheld is an important part of democracy um, too. Mm -hmm. The violence issue I do think is um, worrying. Any look at the history of democracies where you start to see the level of violence growing against both against elected officials or elected people, politicians, but also in the ways in which people again, back to the loser's consent issue, who respond to be on the losing side of election by taking to the streets. All these things are reasons why, when that happens, we should worry about what's happening in democracy. Okay. Can I just make one, one relevant point? The, one of the great sources of frustration in UK politics at the moment is over housing. Uh, it's a source of polarisation between generations, you might say. Um, and the government did actually have a very you know, well-worked-out plan for reforming the planning system to allow more houses to be built. And then the, was it the Chesham and Amersham election was lost thanks to Lib Dem NIMBYism. Um, and that caused the Tory backbenches to be absolutely terrified. And the planning reform never happened. Okay, Nabila, unless you have a particular passion to speak about <clears throat> South Cambridge, we'll just move. Just move um, I think there was somebody in the back. Yeah, uh, there's a gentleman at the back with the glasses. Right at the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get it part way. Yeah. Kick, kick it, kick it. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Hello, can you all hear me? Okay, cool. Um, kind of carrying on, it's a more UK-based question. So obviously our voting system is first past the post for general elections, and most European countries have proportional representation when it comes to voting. But the only other comparison, as far as I'm correct, by European standards is that the only other country that has first past the post is Belarus, which is obviously essentially a modern dictatorship. Do you think that there is a future for actually our current voting system, or do you think the UK should move towards propor proportional representation? I, I think I'm just going to ask for a yes-no on that, because we've sort of done PR a little bit before, but uh, Helen, PR, would you accept it? Uh, 
I, of course, I'd accept if that was the outcome. I, I'm skeptical of PR. Um, I'm not. I've moved from the position of being supportive of it into being largely against it. You want a quick reason why I think the 2019 UK general election showed the advantages of forcing the voters to decide what the thing that they most cared about was and not having parties in Parliament working that out? Nabila, PR, yes or no? Uh, um, I would say the British system as it is does a very good job at the moment at controlling the extremists. And I think what needs to be done in general is to restore faith in national institutions, including parliamentary democracy. David, yes or no? Mm. Um, I mean, I think our kind of party system is pretty constipated. Um, and actually, we could do with um, PR to... I mean, or, or bigger point, we have, um, as indeed many European liberal democracies, we've got a kind of missing majority problem. I mean, um, it became a bit of a cliche in the sort of 2019 um, sort of failed Tory realignment debate, but the, the, the kind of sweet spot in most of our democracies is a little bit to the left economically and a little bit to the right socially and culturally. And none of our mainstream parties, for, for all sorts of historic and contingent reasons, represent that kind of missing majority view. I think if we had PR, I mean, actually, populism often ends up being a kind of deformed version of that, of that missing majority, albeit often with, with lots of historic baggage. And I think if we had PR in the UK, we could have, you know, like the SDP, the old David Owen party, which still exists, it only has Rod Little as its one member, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, that party would be, you know, under PR, I think, would, uh, okay. would be very popular. Do Last question. One yeah. more. Last question from uh, right over here, which is... Yeah. Go on. Thank you. Um, this is a quick one. Like um, something like Laclau and Mouf sort of um, theorised, is there a distinctively populist ailment to democracy? A distinctively populist what? Uh, ailment. Uh -huh. um, illness. Uh -huh. um, Hello. Um, well, David, you take that first and we'll go for it. I mean, this sort of comes back to the question of sort of the surrounds of, demo you know, as Helen said, well, democracy means peaceful exchange of power um, and a degree of representation, a representation of majority voters. Um, but we don't think of democracy as that. We think of democracy as, as being surrounded by liberal norms, rule of law, minority rights, and so on. Um, all the good things. Yeah, I mean, all, all, the, all the necessary things. Um, but, you know, democracies can get out of sync. Um, people can feel that some of those, some of those surrounding aspects have, have, do not represent their interests in some ways. And that, I mean, that is when, um, you know, populism sort of has its day. And, and I think we did see something of that in... Uh, in the UK and the US from the, the kind of late 80s, early 90s on, the kind of hubris about globalization and uh, where, as it were, the liberal graduate class um, ruled too much in its own interests. I mean, obviously, lots of things that the liberal graduate class, everybody else wants too, um, but there was a very, you know, the, you know, the openness that is that comes naturally to to people who have been quite mobile in their own lives, particularly in this country because we have mainly residential universities. Things, you know, the, the openness that made people think um, that, that, you know, people who have um, what what I call um, achieved identities. Actually, not my idea. It's uh, Tolkien Parsons, the American sociologist, talked about ascribed and achieved identities. If you, you know, people in the kind of anywhere class have done well at school, they've gone to more or less good universities, they have more or less successful professional careers, their sense of themselves comes from their own achievements. Many other people, even in rich democracies, still derive their identities from place and group. And if those things change very rapidly, they feel very discomforted in a way that kind of, you know, the anywheres didn't, you know, didn't have sufficient empathy, or at least the political elite uh, of the Anywhere class, didn't have sufficient empathy for that. I mean, Tony Blair's 1999 speech 
saying 50% of the population should go, of school leavers should go to university. Clearly nobody in, in his entire entourage imagined themselves being the 50% that didn't go to university. When 5 or 10 or 15 or even 20% of people go to university and you don't, it's not a big deal. But when 50% of people go from your school or your, your, your town or whatever and you don't, you might well feel like a second-class citizen. Um, and I think it was that, it's that that has kind of allowed the, uh, you know, the, the, the accompanying music of democracy since the early 90s has kind of allowed for a, a legitimate populist pushback. Nabila? Yes, I, I would think, I, I would suggest that um, um, liberal democracy has in many ways lost its way and uh, it, it affects countries all over uh, the world. As far as the global north is concerned, a failure of capitalism and especially the global financial crisis reinforced a sense of you know, um, very uh, d uh, staunch inequalities, uh, a sense of discrimination and uh, segments of society feeling left behind. Um, and this quite obviously has a negative impact on any chances of development of liberal democracy in the global south. So I think it's about coming to a, a compromise where um, sex sections of society do not feel that way. And uh, it's obviously, in, in my view, uh, uh, can be resolved through implementing uh, policies that, that are fair. Now, that's uh, you know, a very easy thing to say, uh, more difficult uh, uh, in, in practice, uh, not least of all when you have vested interests, where people at the top, the established elites, will always be looking after the interests of uh, the already rich people and doesn't necessarily uh, you know, include uh, uh, those who are, uh, feel uh, that are, ha they have fallen out of the system, uh, either because they are just friend, uh, you know, citizens of a country that feel that they are left behind, or uh, more critically, uh, people who, from immigrant backgrounds who are treated uh, in, in, uh, appallingly uh, most of the time. Uh, but... Um, I would say that, you know, whether, uh, it, no matter what end of the political spectrum you, you believe in uh, or where you come from, I think you're always looking for justification in the end, a justification um, that is um, uh, to justify your belief, whether you're on the far right, whether you are on the far left, whether you're a centrist, and that ultimately um, um, goes through an, a democratic process. So that's the, the, the tenet in all this. Uh, justification always has to come through a democratic process, whatever your political belief is. Final word from Professor Thompson. I think that actually the word populism doesn't really help us understand where we are with um, democracy. I think that people fell back on it in 2016 because they didn't really have a very good vocabulary for understanding the kinds of democratic phenomenon that there were in 2016. Some of them were worrying, some of them less so. But I think at the centre of it is the very complicated relationship between democracy and nationhood, in that people need to see that historically, thus far, democracy and nation states have gone together. That doesn't mean to say that they always have to be forevermore, but we haven't actually come up with a way of doing democracy outside nation states and citizens of um, nation states. So when in 2016 the language of nationhood got inserted into all this, it looked like intrinsically worrying. I don't think it is intrinsically worrying, it's just that's where we historically have been and haven't got past yet. Nonetheless, within that context, the language of nationhood could be quite destabilising of democracies when it's tied to nativism, which I think is what Trump did do in 2016. I think there was much less of that in... Um, Brexit. So is there something in democracy that's almost like inherently there that has got the potential to threaten it, sicken it, in that language from time to time? Yes. But at the same time, I don't think we're in a position yet where we can escape the dangers of democracy that come from that place, because we haven't figured out a way to do democracy on a multinational basis. And again, I absolutely don't mean on a multi-ethnic basis. I mean on what it would be like, say, to have a fully democratic European Union. Please join me in, in thanking our participants. Here.
thank you all very, very much for coming. It's very challenging to...